My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. Um, before I introduce the subject and the speaker, let me just remind you that um, if you would like to raise a question or a comment, please use the Q&A box at the bottom. When you do so, it will be very helpful to me if you could give information to identify who you are. But if you would then like to stay anonymous, you can say so. Indeed, please say so. And I will respect that and not reveal your identity. But knowing where the question comes from will help me to pick questions to put to the speaker if we have a lot of questions to be uh, put. The subject is a very important one in the current situation, which is on the subject of the great decoupling China America and the struggle for technological supremacy, as we are still in an era when the Americans and the Chinese are feeling increasingly uncomfortable with each other. And they certainly are competing in a whole range of areas, in particular in the most advanced of technologies. And to address this subject, I'm delighted that we have um, Nigel Ingster, who is probably, um, if not, then at least one of the world's leading authorities on the subject. And indeed, he has just published a book on this very title, which was released, I think, at the end of last year in December 2020. Um, Nigel is a senior advisor on China and cybersecurity at IISS in London, where he had previously served as director of future conflict and cybersecurity. Nigel is, of course, also a research associate at the SOAS China Institute and also a director or the director of geo strategy and intelligence at um, Anodote Economics. Um, some of you will know, um, some may not, that Nigel had served for 31 years in the SIS, the British Intelligence Service, and he retired as Assistant Chief and Director of Operations and Intelligence in 2006. I think since then he was mostly with the I S and has been very generous in sharing his insights and thoughts with um, various institutions. So over to you, Nigel. Well, Steve, thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who's uh, taken um, time out to come and listen on this one of the hottest days uh, of the summer thus far um, in London, at least. Um, I'd like to start with a, a, a small um, disclaimer stroke um, apologia um, in that um, when I was asked by my publisher to write this book, I had no plans to write it or any other book on China. I'd already written one called China's Cyber Power, which looked at you know, the ways in which China was using its growing technological capabilities for broader geostrategic purposes. And I was wondering whether I would really have anything to add here. But this coincided with a period when, as Steve mentioned, uh, US-China relations were undergoing a sudden and dramatic uh, deterioration. Um, and a lot of things were being said in the West about China that in my view, uh, critically lacked any uh, historical or cultural context. And so I thought that even if from the technical perspective, I may not be saying too much that's original, it was important to try and write an accessible book that set out the context and sought to explain in a nutshell, why China feels driven to behave in the ways that 
that it is doing before then going on to look at you know, China's behavior and what uh, the implications of that are in particular uh, with the United States and viewed very much through the prism of advanced uh, technologies. Um, so you know, one, one of my main purposes was to address the phenomenon of what uh, Professor Christopher Andrew of uh, the intelligence historian of Cambridge University has referred to as historical amnesia. Though I have to say, in the case of Western policymakers, it's less amnesia because that at least implies that you knew something to start with. Um, there, 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 there's a pretty pervasive uh, lack of um, understanding uh, where, where, where China is concerned. I'm always, you know, have in my mind um, this image um, of um, the great um, historian of Chinese um, technology and science, Joseph Needham, standing in the library of his Cambridge College, Keys College, reflecting on the fact that the the shelves were groaning beneath the weight of books about every conceivable aspect of British and European history. And yet there was not a single volume about China in that entire collection. Not a lot has changed, I'm afraid. Um, so let's start with the phenomenon of China as a major civilizational power and a major global technology power, because for most of recorded history, that is what China was. Um, uh, China um, accounts for probably 50% of pre-industrial revolution um, inventions. Um, China's own record of um, um, knowledge uh, about uh, technology and not really science, but proto-science certainly um, is very extensive. Um, and this is something that I don't think any, anybody really appreciated until the gentleman I just referred to, Professor Joseph Needham, um, began to, to study the sub subject um, and produced a um, multi-volume uh, series um, looking at all the different things that uh, you know, China had done. And if you look at agriculture, you know, astronomy, um, civil engineering, mining, um, um, hydraulics, um, you know, Ch China you know, really had um, developed uh, very significant capabilities. And ironically, um, although China thinks of itself as a land-based rather than a maritime civilization, um, it was China's maritime discoveries, um, you know, the compass, um, you know, the general design of ships um, that, that uh, basically um, um, enabled uh, the age of exploration that uh, uh, China itself uh, did not engage in, um, and the West did. And the big question that Joseph Needham addressed in this multi-volume uh, series that he, he produced on China's science and technology was, you know, it's been called different things, the grand question, et cetera. How come China that was you know, in, the middle, in, in our middle ages so technologically advanced, how come China did not make the leap to the knowledge that enabled the Industrial Revolution. And um, this was, you know, he, he, you know, he made the point that you know, to do this, what you needed was an application of mathematical hypotheses to nature, full understanding and the use of experimental method, the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, the geometrization of space and acceptance of a mechanical model of reality. And you know, for better or worse, you know, the, 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 the truth is that China had some of this, uh, but didn't have all of it. And somehow the institutional underpinnings to make that um, leap uh, towards a kind of truly scientific culture are simply not there. And it remains an issue today. I remember um, middle of last year, uh, listening to a very interesting speech given by um, um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Liu Yadong, who is the chief editor of uh, Science and Technology Daily, where he was reflecting on um, China's uh, technological and um, scientific prowess 
and saying essentially not so fast. We need to remember that one thing China never really did was develop its own indigenous scientific tradition. And you know, for better or worse, that, that is um, the case. And of course, that reality came home to roost when China encountered the more materially advanced civilizations of the industrialized uh, Western nations led by um, the United Kingdom. Um, and this kind of fall from grace, um, this is the next really thing I, I want to talk about, you know, this, this sense of a fall from grace, um, is something the impact of which simply cannot be exaggerated in terms of its impact on the kind of collective Chinese psyche. One can argue to, to the end of time about um, what China's civilizational history consisted of and whether China was you know, a unitary state, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the simple fact is that you know, for probably the best part of 4,000 years at least, maybe longer, there was a sort of basic sense of a Chinese civilizational state. Um, and for at least 2,000 years, um, an expression of that as a geographical reality, albeit you know, one that waxed and waned and underwent all kinds of um, alterations. Um, but, but the fact is that there was this very, very strong sense of a Chinese kind of civilizational identity um, that saw the world as essentially divided between China and the Sinicized states like Vietnam, Japan and Korea that were essentially civilized and hence mattered and the rest of the world, which they sort of knew about, but didn't really care because it was populated with uncouth barbarians like the British. Um, and uh, you know, didn't really care about them. Um, but this sense that China was, you know, I mean, you know, this, this term China as uh, the Middle Kingdom, Jungo, is, is, is a very recent neologism. You know, China never really used to refer to itself in that way, or you know, conceive of itself in that sense. Um, but this idea that China was, you know, the kind of epitome of, of, of civilization uh, were, were, was very deeply embedded. And to encounter a, um, a more materially advanced civilization um, you know, with guns and steamships and railways, um, but in China's eyes, um, you know, um, uncouth and lacking in any sense of ethics were, 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 was a big shock and set off a kind of massive um, drive to secure a modern identity, but one that had a distinctly Chinese civilizational character. And I would argue that's essentially what China has been at for the last 150 plus years and still is. You know, this really is a kind of key um, feature of, of, of um, what China's up to. And then certainly since the establishment of the People's Republic um, in 1949, there's been this very sort of strong sense, and you know, the, the, the Chinese term of art is Gan Chao, to catch up with and overtake the West. Um, this was very much uh, what, um, you know, um, and, and, and you know, this precedes you know, um, the People's Republic, um, but getting from here to there has been a very difficult process. Um, initially, um, the arrival of the West encountered a lot of conservative resistance. For example, trains, you know, were seen as unacceptable because these, you know, straight steel lines carving up the landscape were seen as entirely antithetical to, to the concepts of feng shui, um, geomancy. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there, there was lots of resistance. And it really was, you know, kind of epic struggle between Kind of intellectual conservatives and modernizers um, to to kind of move uh, China uh, forward. Um, the situation was further complicated by um, a very um, difficult set of geopolitical uh, relationships. I'm not going to give you a potted history of China in two minutes, uh, but suffice to say that um, 
by the time the People's Republic was established in 1949, um, you know, China, which um, had been uh, one of the world's foremost civilizations, um, accounting probably for about 30% of total global economic activity, and as I said, 50% of uh, pre-industrial um, revolution inventions, uh, were, were, was um, um, in a pretty battered state. Um, and it got worse thanks to the early administrations of uh, Chairman Mao, uh, whose focus on um, class struggle as the key link um, eclipsed um, any considerations of economic development um, and you know, um, led to a series of disasters, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, um, which you know, had the effect of uh, stopping China uh, in its tracks. And you know, science um, and technology obviously played an important role there because for most of the Maoist era, scientists and engineers were seen as you know, um, class enemies, you know, members of the bourgeoisie. Um, you know, many Chinese scientists from overseas came back to join the, the People's Republic and build a new China, only to find that they were subject to, you know, investigation, thought reform, and often, you know, sort of sent down to the countryside to shovel shit, uh, rather than um, doing anything, you know, professionally useful. Um, by the time of the Cultural Revolution, um, the only Chinese scientists left standing were those um, involved in China's nuclear and satellite programs, and even many of them were subject to violent abuse leading to, 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 their, um, to their deaths. And um, the extent you know, to which ideology trumped um, science and technology uh, can be seen from the struggle against Einstein that took place in the latter phase of the Cultural Revolution and is graphically depicted in the, um, the Chinese um, science fiction classic, The Three Body Problem. You know, Einstein was basically the subject of struggle because his concept of relativity was seen as uh, contrary to a Marxist vision of, of the universe as uh, steady state and infinite, um, which was, of course, based on uh, no scientific uh, assessment whatsoever. So anyway, China has been through you know, a very uh, long and difficult um, process of pursuing a modern identity with distinct Chinese civilizational characteristics. But it was really only um, in the late 1970s, after the Cultural Revolution was put to bed um, and Deng Xiaoping's pragmatism uh, started to take hold, that um, China really began to develop um, its uh, potential. Um, and advanced technology was, from the very early stages, seen as uh, critical for this. You know, you know, I, I first visited China in November 1976, the day after the Cultural Revolution had formally drawn to an end, and, and it really was, um, you know, to call it backward, didn't begin to, to describe it. Um, and you know, there was a, a, a long way to make up. But from the very outset, China's leaders were seized of the importance of advanced technology uh, to promote China's economic um, modernization. And this was thanks largely to the writings of one man, Alvin Toffler, an American futurologist, um, whose books, um, Third Wave and Future Shock, um, were selling like hotcakes um, in China when I was there during the early 1980s, uh, read by the top leadership. And as with all futurologists, uh, a lot of what uh, Toffler said was kind of off the mark and, uh, and, and a bit mad. 
Um, but when it came to assessing how modern information communications technologies would transform uh, human existence, he was absolutely on the money. And China's top leadership, up to and including Deng Xiaoping, bought into that. Um, and even though you know, this was a time when, you know, when ordinary phone lines were a rare luxury, <clears throat> the potential of modern communications was uh, very apparent. To start, of course, China had to um, work out how to leverage US technology expertise. Um, I mean, the internet didn't come to China until 1996, um, at least not for general uh, access. Uh, but prior to that, uh, a lot of preparatory work uh, was going on because there was recognition of how important uh, the internet uh, would be. Um, and uh, initially, a lot of China's technologies, advanced technology success was the product of a close interdependence between the US and China. You know, China needed the basic US technology, the software, the hardware, the know-how, and the offer that it was able to make in return was, of course, the um, ability to manufacture, um, you know, to do low-end manufacture uh, at a scale and cost that no other economy could match. You know, I'm just being rather rude about Mao Zedong. I, I don't want to be rude about him because in his own way, he was a rather special person. Um, and not everything he did for China was a disaster. Um, under his rule, um, some, some of the very uh, important basics were got right in terms of uh, uh, literacy, education, and public health. Uh, so you know, wh wh when the opportunities um, for China arose, after the end of the Cold War, as the next phase of globalization took hold, China was um, particularly well placed to, um, to ride that wave and did so very well. But as I said, it was a joint effort uh, with, um, with the United States. Um, and you know, the, the extent of that can be seen from the fact that uh, um, in, in the mid-noughties, um, uh, Windows XP was the um, communications technology of choice for the whole of China. The entire uh, Chinese government ran on it, but it was actually mostly pirated um, versions of Windows XP that didn't uh, get the technology upgrades. And when in, I think, 2014, Windows, you know, Microsoft decided that they were no longer going to support Windows XP, they had to make an exception for China because the consequence would have been, you know, the, the, the result would have been disaster had they, had they not, um, had they not uh, done so. But China wasn't just helplessly dependent on US technology. What they also were able to do was to leverage a lot of uh, Chinese talent that had gone abroad uh, for education, had done, so to speak, apprenticeships at Silicon Valley, and then came back to China and were starting to use their particular skills uh, to develop um, a range of uh, digital goods and services that Chinese consumers were eager to address. And this, I think, is a sort of key to China's success so far in terms of technology, um, in that it's a combination of relentless um, succession of top-down dirigist planning, you know, the five-year, you know, the, the, the five-year planning cycle. Um, but beneath that, the creation of you know, an enabling environment in which um, private sector corporations could compete in a, you know, in a no holds barred, um, red in tooth and claw capitalist uh, competition, um, at the end of which um, some major national champions emerged, uh, whereupon the Chinese party state started to move in and you know, gradually over time um, exercise greater control. It was a high risk strategy because China was very much aware that the internet, while conferring a lot of um, economic advantages, 
was also a potential vector for um, uh, ideas uh, and concepts that would challenge um, the prevailing um, narrative of the party state. And, and this was you know, a risk they kind of had to be prepared to take. But um, they very quickly, I think, moved to get on top of this um, through a variety of means, um, um, were able relatively quickly to get you know, a grip on control of internet content. And we saw arising this idea of cyber sovereignty, the, the right enshrined in international law um, for states to control um, the data and information that transited their sovereign uh, cyber space. This has not been accepted yet as a kind of uh, aspect of international law, but it's something that China has been vig very vigorously promoting. And it enjoys much resonance, particularly in the developing world. Um, and so, well, China very quickly moved to a position of being what Xi Jinping, when he came to power, called a big cyber power. In other words, it, it was a, a, a country in you know, which it very rapidly uh, acquired a huge user base, particularly once um, smartphones uh, came um, into to being in the mid uh, 2000s. Um, and it was um, a country that was very quick to develop a uh, digital economy um, in ways that were very ingenious um, and um, outstripped anything that uh, US uh, competitors were able to do. And you know, I'll give you an, an example, eBay. Um, the US thought that uh, they could run China in eBay as just another branch of eBay, everything run from uh, uh, America with no um, account taken of the particular preferences of Chinese consumers. Chinese competitors arose who, you know, like Jack Ma of Alibaba, who were very alert to the preferences um, of Chinese consumers. And they were very quick to develop a range of services that far outstripped what eBay was able to do. And essentially eBay was run out of town. And we've seen this with a you know, number of other things with fintech where companies like Alibaba um, and Financial and uh, uh, Tencent, another one of the major Chinese digital giants that has emerged over the last few years um, have provided um, a digital payment service that enabled um, China to leapfrog the, the credit card altogether um, and is now already um, uh, paving the way for China to develop its own digital currency in ways that inter-alia will enable it to minimize the impact of US financial uh, sanctions. But inevitably, as China got bigger and more powerful, so its ambitions um, expanded. And in my book, I, I, I talk a lot about that because I think it's very important to understand what uh, China's kind of um, um, long-term uh, vision should be. I, I, I'll, I'll come to that um, in a minute. Um, and as they became technologically um, more uh, confident, um, so we saw uh, the Chinese party state using its growing uh, technological uh, expertise and reach um, to shape an international environment that was better suited to um, the interests of that party state. Um, and this is where I, I think um, geopolitics and um, culture uh, come into the mix. Um, the US and China never had an easy relationship. And it was a relationship that, to a very significant degree, I think, depended upon both sides papering over the cracks and not 
um, and, and accentuating the positive and not belaboring the very significant differences that um, existed between them. I think this is very important uh, to, you know, to, to get this in context because there has, I think, arisen within the United States in recent um, years, in the last couple of years at least, this narrative that um, US engagement with China has been a failure rather than um, creating uh, a China that is a benign international presence um, that is very much a status quo power um, um, and you know, um, one that can be expected over time to converge um, with um, international norms um, that have been dictated by the victorious Western powers after World War II. Instead, engagement has created a kind of Frankenstein's monster, if you like, you know, an ideologically hostile state that is uh, revisionist and um, um, you know, in, in, in the sort of worst imaginings of uh, you know, some of the hawks in the Trump administration uh, aspiring to take over the world um, and um, you know, displace the United States as the number one power. Um, well, we can discuss all of that uh, in the Q&A. What I would say is that it's important to remember that the US engagement with China was not by and large um, built on this sort of Pollyanna-ish expectation that everybody would uh, join hands and uh, march together towards the sunlit uplands, but rather on a more hard-headed uh, set of uh, pragmatic um, calculations um, that, 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 that were you know, much less uh, focused on the expectations that China would, um, in inverted commas, become more like us. That was a relatively late um, kind of uh, conceit, um, uh, which I think was you know, fed very much by um, the, the commercial, the US commercial community for its own reasons. Um, but the simple fact is that um, there is, you know, the, the, you, know you, you can track um, the process by which um, the uh, US and China have um, experienced the parting of the ways. And in the book, I highlight three key dates, um, which are firstly 2001. That was the year in which China was admitted to the World Trade Organization on a developing nation basis. Um, at the time, that seemed like you know, a highly desirable thing. And there is no question that China's accession to the WTO turbocharged its economic growth. You know, that, that was a period when we saw, you know, sort of year after year, um, high um, two-figure digital um, uh, GDP growth, you know, year in, year out. Um, but um, was problematic because, um, well, simply because an economy of China's size that was still uh, very much uh, a closed economy has had the effect, um, I would argue, of bending the whole World Trade Organization mechanism out of shape. It was never designed to cope with an economy that big that wasn't you know, uh, prepared to move towards playing by the rules, so to speak. And I'm happy to you know, sort of pick up on that and you know, talk about it further in Q&A. The second key date was 2008, the uh, global financial crisis. Um, notwithstanding the fact that China was at least as much responsible for this crisis as the United States, um, for China's leaders, this was seen as a kind of moment of epiphany. You know, the, 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 you know, the proof, if needed, that the Washington consensus um, was a false god. Uh, proof that the United States could not be relied upon prudently to manage uh, the global uh, economy. And I think they had a point there. Um, and um, that uh, if China was to avoid 
the very deleterious consequences to its own economy of this particular crisis, and they were, um, that it would have to strike its own path. And then, of course, the third key date was 2012, when uh, a certain gentleman by the name of Xi Jinping was elected uh, Secretary General of the Chinese Communist Party, replacing uh, Hu Jintao, who um, was a very different uh, personality um, altogether. Um, and I think you know, these, these, you know, these, these three kind of milestones, if you will, um, you know, help us to sort of track um, the beginnings of um, the dramatic changes that uh, we have seen um, between uh, the US and China uh, in recent years. Um, and in particular, uh, I think we, um, you know, um, you know, the, the impact of Xi Jinping as a leader cannot be overestimated. And it's worth saying a couple of uh, words about him because I do you know, touch upon him quite a lot in the book. Um, and you know, Xi's an interesting character. Um, his father, Xi Jinping, was one of the founding fathers of the party, uh, but fell foul of Mao Zedong and spent a lot of time in, um, 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 in, um, in custody of various forms. Uh, Xi Jinping himself uh, was rusticated uh, to remote uh, rural um, uh, Shanxi during the Cultural Revolution. Um, and it doesn't get more rural than remote rural Shanxi. Um, and yet, Notwithstanding uh, th that, um, rather than seeing his, you know, not, notwithstanding the fact that his family was persecuted by Mao, notwithstanding this um, rustication to the countryside, rather than uh, undermine his faith in uh, the Chinese Communist Party, it seems to have um, reinforced it to the point where I think she uh, made 10 unsuccessful applications to join the party before he was finally um, allowed in. Um, and you know, see, in your, um, I guess you, you'd have to call him a princeling, you know, as in one of the uh, sons and daughters of the founding fathers, this group of uh, people who are not particularly homogenous or tight knit, but um, you know, have been brought up uh, in the conviction that uh, the Chinese Communist Party had earned the right to rule China and that they, the sons and daughters of the founding fathers, um, had the right to uh, derive benefits uh, from this. And as my grandmother would have said, uh, in many ways, Xi Jinping is no better than he should be, but compared with many uh, people um, in, in the party at the time that he took over, is actually relatively Puritan in terms of his inclination. He took over the party at a time when um, the, you know, the, the, the good days, you know, the, the, the high rolling uh, fast uh, growth um, era had led to a pervasive uh, culture of um, corruption uh, within the party that he saw as um, potentially terminal for the party's uh, future, if not addressed. And he also inherited uh, the chairmanship of the Communist Party um, at a time when the Chinese economy was uh, in the hands of some very powerful vested groups who stood in the way of um, uh, reform and further necessary modernization. Um, so he was appointed with a remit to kind of clean things up, but nobody quite expected the Spanish Inquisition, which was what they got in the form of a very pervasive um, and continuing anti-corruption campaign um, that usefully enabled him to mop up all his major um, opponents, uh, knowing that everybody's hands had been dipped in the blood. Um, and also uh, a, a dramatic uh, reinforcement of party orthodoxy and doctrine. And you know, we, 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 you know, we're seeing, you know, we, you know, I, I have lost count of the number of important speeches uh, that Xi Jinping has been made on um, aspects of uh, party dogma, um, you know, the number of uh, uh, dense and impenetrable books that he has uh, written on the subject. 
Um, but it, you know, it, it, it is absolutely pervasive and kind of all consuming. But one of the things that Xi Jinping was very, very big on was again, grasping um, the um, importance of technology um, and bringing it under control because you know, the 2000s um, where China's technology concerned, you know, they'd seen a dramatic expansion of capabilities, but in kind of wild East conditions with very little in the way of effective regulation, um, a focus on um, content control at uh, the expense of actual technical security. So China, you know, when she took over, found itself uh, with a large, sprawling, very lucrative um, uh, cyber domain, but one that was um, regulated poorly, if at all, and was very uh, vulnerable to um, outside um, interference and attack to the point where you know, Russian uh, cyber criminals were regularly using China as a springboard for their exploits because it was so easy to get in. Um, and she you know, took this all in hand um, and began to set in place um, meticulously over time, um, a regulatory environment um, for the cyber domain and for cyber tech uh, and, and for advanced technologies, together with you know, um, a further kind of relentless drive to become what he termed a strong cyber power, but also um, to set out centenary goals, um, um, which envisaged China becoming the leading global technology power in the world by 2035. Um, and we saw you know, a variety of plans, things like Made in China 2025. Um, we saw um, national uh, telecommunications champion Huawei deployed overseas to develop um, um, mobile networks um, in countries all around the world and to become a leader in fifth generation mobile technology. Um, and at the same time, we've seen uh, China uh, moving uh, to, um, you know, uh, to aspiring to a dominant position in global technology standards in a variety of different technologies, starting with, but by no means restricted to 5G. Um, because China is well aware that if it can get its technological um, standards accepted as the global norm, it can then leverage its unique um, um, combination of manufacturing capacity and economic power to really achieve uh, domination in, in, you know, globally uh, in these technologies. And there's a huge uh, amount to play for. And China has also um, appreciated that it can use its dominant position or its growing dominance in technology to shape uh, global norms, rules in relation to how these technologies are employed. So, you know, um, you know we, we see China very active in uh, international discussions on cyber governance, promoting ideas like cyber sovereignty. Um, and we see China very much engaged in uh, global discussions on cyber security, again, you know, promoting very much its own uh, vision of how things should be. And this vision is very broad and all encompassing. Um, it's encapsulated in a phrase that seems bland to the point of innocuousness, you know, the community of common destiny for mankind. Who could, address, who could object to that? You know, what curmudgeon, what you know, sort of Scrooge figure could object to an idea like that? But uh, deconstructed, it turns out to be essentially an idea for a, a, you know, a Chinese-led world order. Led in a very different way from how the British did it in the 19th 20th century and the Americans in the 20th century, but uh, um, you know, a global order led by China um, nonetheless. Um, 
So, yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, you know, China's technology has been shaping uh, you know, uh, China internally uh, in many, uh, you know, dramatic ways. Uh, we've seen, for example, how um, technology within China has been used for purposes of social control and to enhance uh, um, uh, national uh, security, which under Xi Jinping has become all encompassing. There is no facet of uh, um, human existence in China that does not come under the rubric of national security un under Xi Jinping. But um, you know, I mean, it, you know, we've seen the emergence of China, you know, China you know, turning into a kind of techno security state with uh, a variety of uh, surveillance uh, mechanisms in place like Skynet um, you know, that the, the, the provide uh, um, wide ranging um, visibility of actions of ordinary citizens. We've got this concept of um, um, that, that, sorry, I've had a mental blank about what it's called um, after talking for so long, but um, you know, the, the social credit uh, concept, which is often misunderstood and misreported in the West, but essentially seeks to use uh, awareness and knowledge of people's digital and offline activities uh, to incentivize good behavior and sanction bad. And of course, we've seen um, the, uh, the 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 um, Xinjiang um, turn into a kind of test bed for all these and other uh, surveillance technologies, many of which are you know, enabled by by uh, Western counterparts. So, two more points that I want to make, and then I'll sort of shut up and uh, you know, leave the floor open for questions. In the last couple of years, we've seen the US uh, mounting a pushback, and that pushback has been quite brutal in its intensity. Um, China, though very advanced, is um, highly dependent on some key areas of US technology, in particular, the most advanced um, uh, advanced logic microchips. Um, you know, in, in a sort of set, you know, sort of 14 to 5 nanometer range, not that those figures really mean very much. Um, and um, essentially, the USA has found, you know, has been um, um, able to deny China access to these most advanced microchips because everywhere that makes them, and there aren't many places, um, does so using equipment, uh, ideas, intellectual property that is American. So the American government can, can prevent uh, this uh, from happening. Um, and this has really led uh, China, uh, you know, A, to conclude that the United States is determined to constrain China's rise, which I think now is a pretty correct and obvious conclusion, and that China has to redouble its efforts to um, detach itself from dependence on US technology whilst at the same time stealing as much of it as they can lay their hands on um, or buying it uh, where that possibility um, still um, exists. Um, but what the USA has done is effectively stop uh, the 5G national champion Huawei in its tracks. Um, and it's also um, cramped the style of a lot of other um, prominent uh, Chinese companies um, that still rely on US technology. Um, but it's not that simple, because at the moment we see um, a Biden administration that has maintained in place the various measures imposed by uh, Trump um, and is trying to orchestrate a more coherent pushback against China than the Trump administration uh, was able to do, but the United States has to contend with two very powerful constituencies in its own um, country that are opposed to this. One is Wall Street, the other Silicon Valley. And in particular, I think Silicon Valley, there are those like um, Eric Schmidt, the former chairman of Google, who now take the view that the United States needs to adopt a strategic approach to the uh, challenge stroke threat from China, 
and accept that um, from a technology perspective, some parting of the ways is both um, inevitable and uh, desirable. Um, but uh, I can assure you that uh, the vast majority of opinion in Silicon Valley um, goes in the other direction and continues to favor the closest possible technology collaboration with China, both for, re you know, for, for financial reasons, but also because of philosophical reasons. There are so many in Silicon Valley imbued with the ideals of the founding fathers um, of, of, of the internet. Um, and this, you know, of course, you know, the, the, this, you know, and, and you know, we also have to take into account the reality that in all areas of advanced technology, which are now the subject of this intense competition between the US and China, whether it's artificial intelligence, robotics, you know, biotechnology, all the achievements that have been registered to date have in varying ways been the result of collaboration between the US and China. Unraveling that is a pretty big ask um, and um, has very uncertain consequences. And this is what I try to address in, in the final section of the book, you know, getting to the finally getting to the point in the title, the great decoupling. There's this parting of the ways uh, between uh, the uh, US and China, which is beginning to look more uh, you know, um, fundamental and, and, and more critical to, to, to how the world uh, will evolve in, in the coming decades. Um, and it's very difficult to say how that will play out. And it's very difficult to know who's going to come out on top. I'm often asked to draw a comparison between the US and China when it comes to all these technologies. Um, and you know, it, it is very difficult to do, but the short answer is that the United States enjoys the advantages of, in, of incumbency, so to speak. They got there first and have a deeper base um, and um, uh, greater strengths, much greater strengths in foundational science, which is still very much of a weakness where China is concerned. Uh, China, on the other hand, has shown remarkable ingenuity and innovation in the application of existing technologies, but it goes beyond that. 10 years ago, I could have conversations in Silicon Valley or in, in Wall Street with people who say, well, we don't need to worry about China because they can copy, but they can't innovate. Well, I think people have got the message now because China is showing a capacity uh, to innovate and not just in you know, the lower order technologies, but in some of the very much higher order technologies like, for example, quantum encryption, where China is clearly you know, um, uh, leading the global field under Professor Pan Jianwei, uh, you know, a remarkably brilliant man, the youngest uh, member of the Academy of Science you know, ever, and he definitely deserves uh, to be there. But we're also seeing you know, uh, remarkable innovation in, in um, lots of other areas. And it's certainly no longer the case that the West kind of uh, rules uh, the roost um, here. Um, the United States has its own problems. Its own education system isn't really producing the sort of educated uh, um, people that, that it needs. So it has to continue relying on people from outside. Uh, and it's been able to attract some of the world's best talent, but now no longer so much from China um, because relations have deteriorated to the extent uh, that they have. Um, so, I mean, I can talk a lot more about you know, who's up and who's down in relation to a particular um, technologies, if uh, you uh, want me to do so. But um, my sense is that, you know, the parting of the ways is starting to happen. It's going to be slow. It's going to be uneven. It's probably a process that will never be completely, um, you know, the, it, it will not be a process that has, you know, a clear end point. Um, but the implications are probably that everybody will end up losing to some degree 
because um, if we end up with um, more separation, less integration, uh, less collaboration, I'm pretty sure that translates into less innovation over time. Um, and it's also created um, particularly um, some very difficult geopolitics. And this is where, of course, Taiwan comes to the fore because Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation has kind of cornered the global market in the production of the most high-end advanced logic chips uh, under production. Nobody in America makes these. Well, actually, that's not true because Intel does, but it's fallen behind TSMC in terms of what it uh, what it can produce. Um, you know, most American uh, chip designers have outsourced manufacture for you know, reasons of uh, economic logic. Um, China can't make the most advanced uh, um, microchips. You know, they're several generations behind the USA in both uh, design and um, production. Um, this puts Taiwan in a very, very interesting position indeed, um, as the source of the most sought after and most desired um, uh, microchips uh, on the planet, 100 miles away from the uh, coastline of China and the subject of Chinese irredentist claims that could, um, before too long, um, be prosecuted um, with military means. So that, I think, is kind of emblematic of the sort of challenges that um, we you know, confront um, in, in um, the 21st century. Um, and it is very much um, a two horse race in between uh, China uh, and the USA. It is a contest that is driven by uh, values and ideology as much as by raw power. You know, Xi Jinping has said, you know, you know there's a kind of, there's a disjunct in China's um, discourse on this because you know, the diplomats talk about uh, China you know, only wishing to achieve a modus vivendi uh, with the rest of the world, uh, Xi Jinping in speeches to the party faithful is saying that uh, uh, the world is in a contest between capitalism and socialism and socialism must prevail. So um, you know, there's no doubt that this is a contest um, uh, from which uh, neither side seems likely to back down. Advanced technologies are critical to this. So. I've come in pretty much on the hour, I think, Steve, and I wanted to leave time for questions, so I'll end it there. Well, thank you very much, um, Nigel, for this fantastic and thoughtful talk. I wanted to press you a bit on the three key days that you put forward, because yeah. you put forward the WTO days, the quick financial global financial crisis date, and above all, the date when Xi Jinping became leader. Yeah. It, come, it, it came across to me that of the three days in the narrative, the last was the most important. Mm. The first one kind of opened the door for China. Yeah. The second one was the date of awakening, but the mm -hmm. third was the date when things really changed. Yeah, yeah, I agree entirely with that, Steve. Um, I mean, you know, Certainly what Xi Jinping was doing when he came to power was a continuation of trends that were already starting to become apparent. You know, we, you know, we, we, we saw under Hu Jintao that China had, you know, in terms of its international relations, moved away from hide and bide, you know, this strategy of Deng Xiaoping, lie low, you know, sort of keep a low profile, you know, don't take a leading position, et cetera, et cetera. China had moved away from that. Um, though it had not formally acknowledged this to be the case. Um, and relations with the USA were already, and the West more generally, were becoming more tense. But I think you know, the, the, the arrival of Xi Jinping did kind of crystallize um, these uh, emerging trends and kind of supercharge them. Um, and it's very much, I think, the case you know, uh, you know, the, the, that... Uh, I mean, people often ask me, do I think Xi Jinping really is a communist? And you know, my reply is, actually, yes, I think he is a true believer. 
I think he believes that communism has got China where it is today. And um, you know, it, you know, uh, communism will get it to where you know he wants it to be the realization of the Chinese dream. Uh, so I think he really, you know, he really, you know, where, whereas you know, under Hu Jintao, membership of the Chinese Communist Party was coming to be seen as just another line in the CV. You know, um, you know, the, the 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 thing that would tip the balance between you and the other guy. If you were interviewing for a job, you were a party member. He wasn't. You'd get the job. That was about you know, all, all, all you know, um, it amounted to. Nobody really you know, took it you know, took it that seriously. But under Xi Jinping, this is you know we've seen this remarkable transformation in terms of you know the way in which ideology is at the forefront of everything. Okay, we have quite a lot of questions, so um, we could sort of tackle them briskly. Uh, the first question I pick comes from uh, Johan Charco from SOAS. How does Xi Jinping's Politburo define technology? Is it largely focused on computing and communications? The PLC still has trouble mastering the jack engine. Is that at the same priority level as the building of their own microprocessor? I've also heard claims that China has embraced building a, a space-based economy along the lines being drawn up by Gerald O'Neill and pursued by Jeff Bezos. Do you take them seriously? Oh, absolutely seriously. Yes, I mean, you know, China, China, you know, China, China, you know, China is aiming for uh, global dominance in every uh, area of uh, uh, scientific achievement. I mean, I just the other day read a speech that Xi Jinping gave on science and technology to the science and you know scientists and engineers um, you know, the, uh, of the Academy um, um, of Science and uh, the Academy of Engineering. And you know, it, it is a remarkable um, you know, list of achievements in all areas um, of technology, including you know, aviation industry. I know China has been struggling to produce its own indigenous uh, jet engine, and that's proven to be one of the more difficult things. Um, and uh, you know, its progress towards all of these technologies is going to be uneven because that is in the nature of these technologies. You know, some, sometimes you know what seems like a promising start turns out to be you know uh, a blind alley, and you have to kind of go back to the drawing board. Um, other things suddenly you know, uh, leap ahead when you 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 didn't think that um, they they were going to. Um, but she um, in in you know, um, in 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 this speech, you know, make, make, makes you know this uh, absolutely compelling case uh, for. Um, the achievements, the very real achievements that China has registered in all areas, and you know, a, a very ambitious um, uh, statement of, of, of where uh, China needs to go. So the short answer is, it, it goes far beyond just information communication technologies. It encompasses every uh, area adv of advanced um, technology. Um, and I think it is emblematic of the way in which these things are taken seriously that last year, the Politburo devoted two whole days, two whole days to the study of blockchain. I can't think of any other uh, government in the world that would ever do anything like that. But blockchain is obviously important to China because they see it as the key to a successful development of a digital currency, a way out of, uh, you know, out from under the, um, you know, the grip of uh, the U.S. Uh, dollar, um, and, and and the message, you know, the relentless um, message from um, China's leadership is its foot to the floor in all areas. Um, of, of uh, technological development. You know, this is front and center. Okay, next question I pick comes from uh, somebody who likes to stay anonymous. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he thanks I you. I would too. He thanks you for your fantastic talk. Uh, you spoke about how with China's drive for technological advancement, mm. China can increasingly shape global rules and standards on cyber governance, security, etc. 
this may result in a China-led world order, but this world order would be led in a different way compared to how the UK or the US did. Could you please explain further how China would lead a world order in a different way? Yeah, that's no, a very fair question. And um, yeah, I think I can explain it because uh, and I'm in good company because I just read a lengthy uh, report by the Rand Corporation looking at exactly this problem. Um, and and uh, the authors of that seem broadly to agree with me, which you know, um, um, elicited a huge sigh of relief, as you can imagine. Um, but I think you know, look, China, you know, China's looked at um, how Britain ran the world in the 19th century with colonies, expensive. Um, the natives aren't very friendly. Sooner or later, they, you know, they get uppity and want independence. Um, you know, more, more trouble than it's worth. They've looked at the US model of um, global hegemony, 800 military bases scattered around the world, you know, very expensive, very demanding. Um, you know, we, we don't want, and they've, they've, they've decided very clearly, we don't want to go down this road. So I think what, they're, you know, what, what, what uh, Beijing sees as the way forward um, is um, through primarily um, economic and technological means. And we see this already in how China deals uh, with other countries. Displease them and you get cut out from access to Chinese markets. Um, Australia knows all about that. You know, other countries have experienced it to varying degrees. Um, you know, play ball and, you know, we'll give you some, you know, sort of, um, um, economic, uh, you know, benefits, and uh, you you can you know have our technology, you know, do do what you like with it, and all we really want you to do in return um, is not piss us off. You know, don't you know uh, allow you know sort of anti-Chinese activities uh, on your um, soil. Um, you know, send us back our dissidents when we ask you to. Um, you know, don't allow your newspapers to write rude things about China, um, and uh, we'll get along famously. Um, I think, in essence, is is what what they kind of what they envisage. It is. I mean, I you know, I know people talk about you know the the tributary you know, the tributary system, and of course, they never you know it, it, there was never anything really called that, at least not by the Chinese, you know, with the term we coin. Um, but you know something, something a bit like that. You know where, 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 where you know the, the, the chairman of the Communist Party sits facing south, to use the Taoist uh, um, analogy, um, and uh, everything works because um, you know it's it, it's all you know um, you know the the world is harmonious um, and uh, ruled um, uh, ethically. Okay, next question by Pitt comes from uh, Mikhail Thielon. China is displaying a superpower's ambition. Mm -hmm. Until recently, it was believed that China would seek an expanded regional road, mm -hmm. and a reduced US road, but would defer to the distant future any global ambitions. Now, however, the signs are that China is gearing up to contest America's global leadership, and it is becoming unmistakable, mm. and they are ubiquitous. Do you agree? Uh, partly, uh, not altogether. I think that uh, China's uh, leaders are realistic, and uh, their, you know, their primary concern is, is to um, secure effective control of, of their own backyard. Um, so, you know, um, I mean, China, China looks at the world in concentric circles, um, and I think you know, what, what they want to do first and foremost is get America, you know, out of their you know, backyard, you know, out of the first island chain, and preferably out of the second island chain, um, if they can, or at least with a very much reduced presence um, and, uh, and impact. That is, you know, I, I think where 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 their immediate uh, priority uh, lies. Um, certainly, um, you know, the, the, you know, I mean, see, you know, the 
the Chinese leadership have made it clear on multiple occasions that they no longer see the US-led global order as fit for purpose in the 21st century. They you know, make the point quite legitimately that it was uh, you know, um, um, put together by the USA and its allies in the aftermath of World War II and reflected you know, Western norms um, and values and failed to take account of uh, you know, other ways or, or, of looking at the world. Um, all to varying degrees true. Um, and what China is, you know, and, and it's been a world order that's been characterized by um, armed blocks and alliances, um, uh, you know, um, and uh, what, what China is proposing is something much more benign, uh, much less uh, belligerent, um, and um, something that takes more account of what they call diversity, by which they mean different uh, political uh, and cultural um, perspectives. Now, all these things, you know, to varying degrees, you know, can can be said to, you know, to, to be true. But and, you know, there, there is obviously a downside if you uh, reject um, universal values, uh, which China explicitly does. Um, you know that that, that 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 can be can be problematic. So I think what China wants you know, uh, you know is, is as much uh, global influence as possible. But this reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, the then State Councillor Dai Bingbo back in two thousand and seven, and you know he he was still sort of chanting the mantra of you know hide and bide. You know China has no you know, ambition, status quo, power, etc. And I said, well, you know, State Councillor. Uh, you're acquiring you know, global interests and uh, you know, um, um, global, you know, you're you just getting more you know, involved in the world generally. Um, and you might want to bear in mind that you know, the, the British didn't uh, set out to you know, paint a quarter of the world pink. It all happened as a result of a dynamic we got caught up in ended up with us doing all sorts of things we'd never planned or wanted to do, like ruling India. Um, and I suspect, State Councillor, that you will find yourself in a similar dynamic. And once you do, there's no knowing where you end up. So I think this is very much the situation where China is in at the moment. They have got a you know, fairly strong sense of how far they want their immediate reach to go. But the problem with power is once you've got it and you exercise it, you know, it, it kind of runs away with you. Okay. You, you mentioned uh, Taiwan in your mm. answer, so I'll pick the question next, which I yeah. raised specifically about the Taiwan issue. And this comes from Graham Nasty in Cardiff. Mm. Do you imply that China wants Taiwan not just for political reasons of unification, but also for economic reasons to ensure that it can lay its hands on the most advanced microchips? Mm. Does China wished over time to have its own China controlled internet mm. to, to have its cyber sovereignty as it were? Yeah. Okay, well, there, there's more than one question there, so I'll break it down. Um, I think yeah, where, where, where Taiwan is concerned for the Chinese party state, um, you know, the, 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 this is a matter of honor. And it's also you know, a matter of real politic because um, the ability of the party state to um, you know, realize national reunification is an important part of its claim to legitimacy. Uh, if you know, it's got Hong Kong back, it's got Macau back, but Taiwan still eludes it. And unfortunately for them, Taiwan's moving in the opposite direction. Fewer and fewer Taiwanese want any part of the mainland, and they certainly no longer believe in one country, two systems. Um, so it's it's getting uh, getting more difficult. But um, you know, Th Thucydides um, said that the drivers of uh, conflict are fear, honor, and advantage. Povos ketimiske ophilos, and that's as true today as it was two thousand whatever it was years ago when Thucydides wrote it. Um, and you know, I think you know, you know, fear, honor, and advantage are all there in the Taiwan equation, both for China and the United States. Um, and you know, all, 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 you know, uh, China's behavior is driven by, by all, all of them. 
fear that if they don't get uh, Taiwan back, you know, they're never going to be able to um, exercise effective control of the waters in their backyard. Fear also that their credibility could suffer, you know, um, if, if they don't make good on their on on their commitments. But also, yes, um, benefit uh, does come into it. It's not quite that simple because even if China were able to take over intact uh, the TSMC foundries, and that's a big if, because I'm not sure America would countenance it. Um, that still doesn't mean that they've got the design skills to actually design the high-end chips that TSMC is there to make. And much would also depend on the extent to which, which if any, TSMC skilled staff were there to, um, to make them. And it's not just that either, because you know, the, 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 this is a process that involves enormously complex uh, supply chains, the silicon, the chemicals for the etching, and of course, you know, the, 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 the technology for, for the advanced you know, extreme ultraviolet uh, etching uh, uh, techniques. So um, just getting hold of the TSMC foundries, even if all the machinery was intact, wouldn't necessarily be a panacea for China's, uh, uh, China's problems. But on the last part of the question, you say, does China want its own internet? Well, to all intents and purposes, it already has one. I mean, you know, the, the, the Chinese internet is, in many ways, a kind of self-contained phenomenon, uh, similar to, but in some ways, very different from the internet that we in the West um, are, are, are familiar with. And, and, and you know, I think it you know, can be characterized as very much its own kind of uh, you know, sort of um, cultural zone. You know, with its own mores, its own you know terminology. Um, you know, um, you know, it, it, it is already very different, and it is largely. I, mean, I, I think the Chinese Party State have achieved uh, technology dominance over the Chinese internet. Doesn't mean to say that people can't say things they don't want them to, but they can you know sort of stifle um, unwelcome discussions very quickly. Uh, if the need arises, and you know, if need be, they can go and find the people making um, um, you know, uh, un disobliging remarks and uh, make them an offer they're not going to be able to refuse. Okay. We've got plenty of very, very good questions. So you could give them very quick answers. That would be fantastic. Okay. Next one comes from uh, Philip Mead. How will the great decoupling impact China's ability to innovate without U.S. collaboration. Mm. How does China's education system itself uh, lend itself to the creative creativity required to innovate? Mm. And do you think that decoupling will encourage China to resort more to covert activities such as cyber hacking, espionage, and intellectual mm. piracy mm. in order to fill the void? Yeah, well, on the last point, it, it, it's actually quite hard to imagine how much more they could do than what they're doing already. But yes, most certainly, uh, I think it would lead to more more of those activities. No question about it. You know, um, what what China cannot get um, you know, uh, legitimately in inverted commas, it is going to uh, seek to acquire illegitimately also in inverted commas because these things are not straightforward. Um, I think you know. There's, there's, again, this pervasive myth in the West that the Chinese education system is all about rote learning and you know, the, the, the poor dears can't think for themselves. And it's really not like that at all. Um, yes, of course, the, uh, the formal exams require a lot of rote learning and uh, you know, um, particularly the ones this year celebrating the centenary of the Communist Party. Um, but um, you know, Chinese people can, of course, think for themselves, can be innovative, creative, and there's plenty of evidence uh, to suggest that. So I don't think that all of a sudden, you know, this, is, this feels like the reverse of the argument that the Qing dynasty made in you know, the 19th century, that uh, if we you know, deprive the barbarians of their rhubarb, their intestines will seize up and you know, we'll have them where we want them. Uh, it's not going to be like that. But the point is that you know, innovation benefits most from international collaboration and um, where, where, you know, an international exchange of ideas and where that is reduced, you know, uh, innovation will be. Okay. Um, next question comes from Ham Jan. 
you did say that uh, decoupling will make both US and China lose. Mm. Question is, China had almost a free rise so far in acquiring mm. technology, food mm. transfer, purchase, theft, mm. Western universities, mm. oh. etc. Mm. If this free rise stops, mm. which looks likely, can Chinese develop their own technology really efficiently at reasonable cost and market it credibly? Mm. If this is not possible, will China not be the greater loser? Well, you know, we, we can't say uh, for certain one way or another, you can't predict the future. But um, I don't think it's necessarily the case. I mean, the fact is that if you look at technology around the world, um, China you know, has um, very significant um, engagement um, in both developed and developing uh, countries, but particularly in the latter. You know, the Chinese technology offered to these countries is something that they find genuinely attractive for all sorts of reasons. And when you look at um, efforts by the USA to, to impose things like uh, you know, the, the Clean Network uh, Initiative, you find that um, you know, countries who've signed up pay lip service to it, but aren't really sort of taking it all that seriously. So, I mean, I, you know, um, I, I, I think China can and will develop um, its own technologies. And B, I think that um, the way in which it can deploy and market those uh, internationally will be and is already uh, very effective. It doesn't mean that you know, everybody's going to flock to Chinese technology everywhere. Um, but I think you know, China is in with a fighting chance. Um, and I don't think it uh, can automatically be assumed that um, China will uh, fall behind, the USA will sort surge ahead. I think I can see uh, a future in which things take the opposite path. You know, we, we, we just had four years of a, a US government that's fundamentally anti-science um, and has defunded a lot of uh, US um, uh, original research work. You've got a US Congress that seems uh, determined to regulate Silicon Valley through what looks to me like a lot of the wrong sort of regulation, in contrast to China, which is regulating its own tech sector through what looks like the right sort of um, regulation. So, you know, don't take it for granted that the United States will carry seamlessly on its uh, current trajectory. Okay. Next question I pick comes from the Facebook feed from uh, Kanchana Raman Nunjang. Mm. Despite its technological advancement, why does China lag behind in the microchip area? Mm. And what will it take before it can catch up? Well, that's a very good question. And the short answer is nobody knows if they knew that they'd have sorted it out by now. But this goes back a long way. Um, back in the 19, early 1960s, China was probably about where the USA was in terms of um, um, uh, semiconductor technology. And then you know, the, the, the intervention of the Cultural Revolution basically decimated China's um, um, emerging nascent um, uh, indigenous uh, sector there. It completely you know, uh, 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 obliterated it. And you know, things like that you know, carry a long tail. Uh, and I think China is in part suffering uh, from, from that. Um, what else? Um, um, I mean, you know, the, the, the different technologies can be acquired by different means. You know, some, you know, to, to, to be put bluntly, some are very easy to steal and copy. Microchip manufacturer is not one of those because manufacturing, designing and manufacturing microchips requires what the Germans call Fingerspitzgefühl, this kind of innate intuitive knowledge that only comes from constant engagement and uh, you know, sort of learning by doing. So if you're not doing that, you're, you're at um, a disadvantage. Um, so I think you know, th these are some of the reasons why, why, why China is uh, still um, behind. We've seen a lot of uh, efforts by the Chinese state to throw money at the problem, and most of this hasn't worked. I think it may in time, 
but this is one of the more difficult technologies. As I said, you can't just get, it'll get the manual and uh, you know, take it from there. Um, next one, I'm combining uh, two sets of questions, but they are all related to standards. Uh, the first one comes from somebody who prefers to stay anonymous. Mm -hmm. And she said that she's always a bit confused by the standards conversation. Mm, could, you give couple, could you give a couple of examples of standards and the technologies that this applies to and perhaps yeah. how they differ between the US and China? Related to this is a question from a SOAS student, Mary Stuckey. Do the national champions also promote technical standards and norms, such as internet sovereignty abroad? How resilient is the Chinese private state nexus in activities abroad? Yeah, okay. Well, um, the, the, the answer to the last question is very, you know, the, 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 the state and the private sector, you know, um, have been working together very well. It, it's it's less so now because I think that um, in in recent uh, uh, times um, some of uh, China's big tech entrepreneurs have been brought to heel by the party and reminded who's really in charge, um, and that I think has crimped their uh, confidence uh, somewhat. Uh, but broadly speaking, the Chinese party state is able to get uh, its private sector do to do what it needs it to do. Um, so I, I don't think that is uh, going uh, going to change. Um, in terms of standards, well, I think um, 5G is the obvious one to point. You know, well, you know, let, let, let's look at one, one area where standards kind of work and, and, and where they don't. Um, one, you know, is, is ordinary electrical appliances. Um, you know, now, you know, there, there are no sort of global standards for electrical appliances. When you travel from one you know, uh, part of the world to another, you know, none of the plugs match. You know, they're, they're, they're all different, and and you've got to you know, if you if you're traveling a lot, you've got to have you know these huge adapters that you know, sort of enable you to plug in you know, all sorts of different sectors. But on the other hand, take um, information communication technology. You know, there is you know sort of one set of plugs that work for all computers and all smartphones. You don't have to carry, you know, lots of different ones with you and adapters everywhere you go. And that's because there has been effective international agreement on what these standards should be. Now, it's not one that particularly affected China because it was the USA that was the dominant factor. But let's take 5G, where the national champ China's national champion Huawei has been filing patents on 5G like there's no tomorrow, has been very heavily involved in all the international uh, negotiations on 5G standards um, and has therefore you know, been very effective at shaping uh, these standards in ways that uh, you know, reflect its own emerging you know, technologies and, and, uh, and capabilities. Um, and it, it is just a kind of you know, virtuous circle uh, where Huawei has been concerned in relation to 5G. So that is an example of how you, you, you can do this. Okay, uh, we have one minute left. So uh, uh, one last uh, question from a SOAS so PhD student, uh, Malaka, Malaka Robinson. Is this US-China tech competition primarily an ideological battle rather than a technological or economic conflict? I would say yes, uh, in a word, um, you know, the, 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 uh, that it's at the bottom of this, you know, it, it's about raw, you know, geopolitical power, it's about technology dominance, but what's really at the bottom of it is values and ideology, you know, and, 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 and two sets of values and ideology that are very, very difficult to reconcile. So yes, I think that is at the heart of it. And uh, you know, in, in, in essence, technology has simply served as an accelerator and, and, and a catalyst uh, for, for this um, um, division that, that, that has already been there, you know, always been there. Well, regrettably, I have been defeated by the clock once again. Um, so I will have to draw this webinar to a closed. 
This is the last webinar we are holding this academic year. Hopefully with the new academic year, most of our events will return to physical seminar at SOAS, but we're also planning to have a small number of webinars that will reach out to people who are not based in London. So please do keep an eye on our events moving forward. Let me just thank Nigel Inkster for a really inspiring and knowledgeable and insightful webinar. And to all of you who have taken part and raised questions, I apologize to those of you whose questions I have not been able to uh, read out to the speaker, but please be assured that your questions will be sent on to him so he will at least know what have been raised by you. Thank you. Make sure to answer them as well. And goodbye.